Finance, but as well as the uh, Department of Economics and also the Open Economics uh, Forum. So uh, I'll be your moderator for uh, the day. My name is Amal Nasser. I'm an economist with the Sa'a Center for Strategic Studies, a think tank working on uh, Yemen and the surrounding region. And we have our speaker for uh, the day is Dr. Adam Hania. Uh, he's a reader in development uh, studies at SOAS, where he teaches the models of uh, migrant labor in the global economy and political economy of development. He works on the political economy of the Middle East, labor migration, class and state formation in the GCC countries and Palestine. He is also an author of uh, three books, uh, the latest uh, of which is uh, Money Markets and Monarchies, the Gulf Cooperation Council and the Political Economy of Contemporary Middle East, uh, published uh, in 2018. So uh, our format for the day will be basically that uh, Dr. Hania will be presenting for a uh, 20 30 minutes and then we'll be collecting your uh, your questions and then we'll have a couple of rounds of uh, questions for uh, dr hania so i'd like to welcome dr hania and uh, the floor is yours thank you thank you very much and thanks everyone for uh, for being part of this uh, today uh what i want to do uh is cover basically two themes uh in today's uh Presentation. Firstly, I'm going to look at some of the uh, debates and, and trends in the, in the global oil markets and what's been happening to the oil price. And then secondly, I want to uh, zoom in a little bit on what this might mean for the Middle East uh, region, particularly the Gulf Cooperation Council states, um, which as Amal uh, pointed out, is, is an area that I, that I work on. So I think we probably all remember the headlines from a little over a month ago, April 20th in fact, uh, when the US uh, oil benchmark price for West uh, Intermediate Oil turned negative uh, for the first time in history, dropping to minus $40 a barrel. That uh, gathered a lot of uh, press and, and coverage uh, globally. Uh, this was part of a wider uh, and very sharp decline in oil prices that had uh, begun in the beginning of this year uh, and has continued essentially uh, uh, until today. There's a variety of reasons uh, for this decline, and I, I just want to highlight two in particular and then and then speak a bit about what this might mean for different actors in the in the oil oil industry and oil markets the first of these reasons for uh the, the decline is the obvious collapse in demand uh, for oil and oil products uh, as a result of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. With uh, much of the world under lockdown, particularly through March and April, uh, an end to air travel essentially, uh, global air travel, uh, a dramatic reduction in, in road transport, uh, and a massive drop in demand for energy, uh, this this collapse in demand um, had felt was really felt, I think, through March and April. Um, in fact, throughout April, uh, the reduction in US automobile use alone led to an astonishing 5% drop in global oil demand. Um, so that's about the same as if the whole of Europe, Africa and the Middle East had simultaneously stopped driving. I think it's quite stark to, to see um, uh, both illustrates the, the reliance of uh, particularly North America on, on um, cars and automobiles, but also the way that uh, uh, this drop in automobile use due to lockdown actually led to such a, a large drop in, um, in demand for oil globally. So that's one thing, uh, and this obviously continues today. We see um, this, this demand uh, 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 continue to be at very low levels. The second thing, though, that was happening also uh, at the beginning of the year uh, was a significant increase uh, or promised increase in the world's supply of oil. Uh, this followed an announcement in early March uh, by Russia and Saudi Arabia that they, both these countries were going to remove uh, their limits on oil um, production levels. Um, they had placed some limits in play, uh, since um, basically the end of 2016. Um, this was something called the OPEC Plus um, Agreement, uh, which I'm happy to speak about a, a bit more perhaps in, in our uh, discussion. But effectively, what this decision of, of both Russia and Saudi Arabia did was to uh, uh, project an, an increase of uh, supply of oil onto the market at the very same moment demand was uh, cratering due to the, due to the pandemic and, and the associated um, measures around that. So we saw a very rapid drop in demand combined with increasing supply. Um, 
and, and this had a very dramatic effect on, on prices, one of which was to, to briefly see uh, West Texas Intermediate Oil drop below uh, uh, or drop into negative territory. Now, today, uh, Brent, uh, the Brent, which is the, the benchmark, international benchmark for oil, is around $34 a barrel. Um, uh, at the end of April, uh, it was around $20 a barrel, but it's, a, it's half of what it was uh, at the end of uh, December 29. So we see quite a um, distinct and continuing um, uh, fall in the price of oil, even though it has um, increased uh, uh, somewhat since uh, that, that uh, April moment. So, what does this mean for the oil industry? And I think um, I want to just speak a little bit about the global oil industry and then, as I said, um, move a little bit onto the Middle East um, and, and uh, some of the major oil producers in the Middle East. So, uh, this obviously uh, has hit all oil producers in a major way, but it's very important uh, to differentiate uh, the effects. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, many uh, oil companies involved in uh, U.S. Uh, markets, particular shale and fracking um, in the United States, uh, have been uh, very severely hit by this drop in the price of oil because these, uh, this particular segment of the oil uh, industry requires um, a relatively high price of oil in order to operate. Uh, profitably. Uh, so with this uh, very dramatic drop, um, they have essentially fallen into, into territory where it's very difficult for them to operate. Um, and at the same time, this is very important to highlight as well, many of the companies involved in uh, shale and fracking in the United States also have very high uh, levels of debt. Um, uh, we can see this, one indication of this, in uh, the fact that energy companies, uh, shale and fracking companies in particular, now make up more than 11% of the entire U.S. junk bond market. Uh, so a, a very significant proportion of um, uh, uh, low quality debt that is uh, 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 owned by, uh, uh, sorry, that, that has been offered um, and owned by these, these involved in shale and, and, and fracking. So uh, in fact, uh, these, these kinds of companies, these energy companies have been the biggest issuers of junk bonds um, in the United States for 10 out of the last 11 years. Uh, so with the drop in the price of oil, um, that segment of the oil industry has been hit um, very severely. So I think uh, if there's little doubt, uh, and this is you know widely predicted and it's in fact it started to happen, uh, that we're going to see uh, some widespread uh, bankruptcies uh, in that particular segment uh, of the North American um, oil industry in shale and fracking. Uh, but I think it's very important uh, not to read this as the uh, somehow an, an oil industry, a return to uh, renewable energy, um, uh, 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 something that is necessarily uh, pro-climate, um, which unfortunately I think a lot of um, commentators have taken this, this, um, this line that this, this uh, uh, drop in the price of oil is something positive in terms of um, climate change. Because I think one of the things that is likely to happen uh, as a result of this uh, drop in uh, uh, or this collapse in, in parts of the shale and fracking industry in North America is that the big oil majors, the, the large uh, oil companies, so we're talking here about companies like BP, Shell, um, Exxon, uh, uh, and a, a few European um, firms, these, these firms, what we can call big oil, uh, look set to further consolidate their control over the industry as a whole. Typically, what happens at moments of crisis is these companies that go bankrupt end up getting swallowed by larger, larger firms. Um, and I think that's um, one of the likely, um, or, or certainly a potential outcome of this current, current moment. Because these big oil companies, although they are involved in um, the, the shale and fracking industries, uh, tend to be more diverse in terms of their geographical um, interests, in terms of which parts of the, uh, the uh, energy market they're involved in, and also uh, their involvement in kind of downstream sectors, so petrochemicals and, and other uh, oil products. Um, uh, so I think one of the things that we're likely to see is some of these, these big oil firms, international oil firms, diversified oil firms, uh, come in and buy up 
uh, some of the distressed assets that we're likely to see in parts of um, the shale uh, uh, segment of the market. There's also, interestingly, um, a move by some big banks. Uh, there was a report a couple of weeks ago to this effect that big banks and big American banks, um, for example, JP Morgan Chase, uh, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Citigroup, these uh, very large uh, financial institutions are also in the process of setting up independent um, companies to directly own oil and gas assets um, in, in this sector of, of um, shale. Uh, so we, 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 we could see the direct entry of these large financial firms into, the, into, these, into this um, sector. So uh, that I think is one um, aspect. It's important I think to diver, uh, you know, differentiate uh, this moment of, of, of crisis uh, 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 across the, the oil industry as a whole. The other thing that I would say in this respect um, is that we can see uh, this moment also being used um, to accelerate measures that uh, were previously uh, uh, seemed to be off the book. So, for example, um, in the United States, a number of states have um, passed laws in, in the recent weeks uh, criminalizing protests against uh, fossil fuel infrastructure, um, calling fossil fuel infrastructure essential um, uh, an essential service uh, and, and thereby criminalizing um, protests against oil pipelines and other sorts of um, fossil fuel infrastructure. Uh, the Trump administration has uh, also taken advantage of this moment to loosen environmental regulations uh, for things like power plants, uh, for factories and other industrial uh, facilities essentially allowing uh, polluters to self-monitor their own um, pollution uh, levels. We can see in Europe as well uh, large banks and financial firms that are, are, are lobbying for a relaxation of climate change um, reporting requirements um, and stress tests around climate change. So the, the point being is that this moment of, of crisis as it's so often uh, crises are so often uh, uh, seen to be is, is, is being uh, used as, as a moment to kind of push through things that might may have been um, previously uh, off the books um, and perhaps reverse some of these uh, uh, climate change uh, demands that have been won in previous, um, previous years. So um, that's, that's a, a very quick, if you like, overview of, of parts of the oil. And there's a lot more that can be said about that and we can perhaps uh, return some of this in discussion. But I, I do want to turn uh, to the Middle East uh, here because the Middle East and the oil producers in the Middle East, the oil producing states in the Middle East, are really important part of the story of, of what we're seeing in oil markets more generally. Uh, general, uh, it, it's, um, as I'm sure people on this webinar realize, uh, the, the Saudi Arabia and other Middle East states are major parts of the, of the world um, oil uh, industry. A approximately 60% of the world's oil comes from just 25 oil fields, um, uh, and these are mostly located in, in Saudi Arabia and other, other uh, Middle East states. Um, when we talk about Middle East uh, oil producers, we can talk uh, uh, about, on one hand, the Gulf monarchies, um, the GCC or Gulf Cooperation Council states. So here I'm talking about Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait and other uh, other uh, states that are monarchies um, and they have a very particular kind of population structure, which I'm, I'm going to come to in a second. Um, so these GCC states uh, are very uh, important parts of the oil market, Saudi Arabia in particular, because it's a swing producer, it's able to uh, 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 increase um, or, or decrease its supply of oil onto the world market relatively easy, e relatively easily. Uh, but then uh, adjacent to the GCC or, or um, in addition to the GCC states, we have uh, other countries like Iraq, Iran, Algeria, Libya. Uh, these states are also major um, producers of oil um, and uh, they, they will also be hit by this drop in, in the price of oil that we've seen. But I think again, we need to differentiate the impact um, here um, quite carefully. Uh, in the Gulf, in the GCC states, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, uh, Bahrain, Qatar, uh, and Oman, uh, we are certainly going to see cuts to social expenditure um, and a reduction in some of the large spending programs um, that were announced um, over the last few years uh, as part of kind of economic reform strategies in, in the Gulf states. Um, but at the same time, these Gulf states uh, do have uh, a 
much greater capacity and accumulated surpluses to be able to weather this storm, in, in my opinion. Um, I'm certainly not saying they're not going to be um, hit by the, the fall in the price of oil, but they have a greater capacity um, to be able to, to, to perhaps ride this out. They have relatively low uh, levels of existing debt. They have access um, to accumulated reserves, and they can borrow fairly cheaply on international uh, markets. Whereas if we look at some of those other states I mentioned, uh, Iran, Iraq, Algeria, uh, and similar oil ex exporting states, it's, they're, they're, it's a very different story. Um, there we can see uh, these states are very dependent upon oil um, and have very little extra fiscal capacity. Uh, the other thing about many of these states, uh, uh, Iraq, Algeria, sorry, Iraq, um, uh, Libya in particular, of course, is that they are states where um, you know widespread conflict um, has been present for 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 uh, over over a decade now. So they are going to be simultaneously hit with falling oil prices as well as um, the conflict dynamics um, associated in those states, as well as um, uh, uh, what is clear is going to be a very heavy uh, global economic downturn. So I think what we're um, likely to see again in the Middle East is a widening differentiation, um, uh, which will further consolidate, uh, ironically perhaps, um, given that uh, we're talking here about a fall in the price of oil, but further consolidate um, the position of the Gulf um, um, in, in the Middle East. It's very interesting in this respect, um, and I, I just want to briefly highlight this point um, in regards to Saudi Arabia, because uh, what Saudi Arabia has been doing uh, fairly quietly over the last couple of weeks, uh, essentially since, um, since April, is to really uh, bulk up its sovereign wealth fund, um, the public investment fund, this PIF, um, Sovereign Wealth Fund of Saudi Arabia, and use this uh, sovereign wealth fund to buy up um, globally uh, assets um, that are much cheaper because of the uh, the, 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 the deep um, economic downturn. Um, in fact, yesterday there was a report stating that Saudi Arabia had actually moved $40 billion from its uh, uh, central bank reserves to uh, the Sovereign Wealth Fund Public Investment Fund, to, to, to a Sovereign Wealth Fund. This is a really striking figure. It's about 10% of Saudi Arabia's foreign reserves. So what Saudi Arabia is trying to do is bulk up its, its, um, this, its, this uh, uh, fund and then use this to buy um, uh, assets outside of the country. So what we've seen in the last uh, uh, month or so, Saudi Arabia has taken major stakes in um, a number of, of, of key uh, uh, companies, for example, um, and and uh, this this one actually left a lot of uh, uh, analysts somewhat puzzled. But they bought into um, the cruise operator Carnival, um, the big shipping line that uh, um, was hit with all of the uh, uh, coronavirus uh, scares uh, over recent months. Um, so they're now, I think, uh, one of the major holders of Carnival. Um, they've bought into BP. Uh, the, the big energy company, Boeing, Citigroup, Facebook. Uh, so they've increased their stakes in all of these firms um, in the last two to three weeks. Interestingly, though, they have also bought into a number of the major big oil energy firms. So Equinor, Dutch, Royal Dutch Shell, Total, um, as well as some Canadian, um, the two largest Canadian uh, shale, shale uh, uh, companies. So it's quite interesting, um, much as I was saying more generally about the, the, uh, uh, the, the shale industry in the United States, where we will see, I think, larger firms coming in uh, and buying up um, some of the distressed assets in that sector. We can see Saudi Arabia doing this actually at the global, at the global level. Um, I'm not, this is not just energy companies they're buying into, but it's interesting that they are um, using this moment to actually uh, increase their stakes in a lot of these, um, these firms. Just one statistic in, this, in, 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 this, uh, in relation to this. Prior to the pandemic, uh, the Public Investment Fund, Saudi Arabia's Sovereign Wealth Fund, had about $2 billion uh, of invested in US listed stocks. That is now around $10 billion, um, the value of, of holdings of US listed stocks uh, by uh, the public investment fund has now reached about $10 billion. So it's increased about fivefold just in the space of a few weeks. Um, um, I think it's an indication of, of what, um, what Saudi Arabia is trying to do. I think we can see similar um, patterns, not just in relation to Saudi Arabia, uh, Qatar is doing uh, playing a similar uh, game as as is United um, Arab 
Hello, Mr. Hania, or was it my connection, or? Hello, sorry about that. Can you hear me okay? Uh, uh, now we can hear you. Just okay. um, we need you also to turn on your camera. Yeah, okay. Yes, okay. Sorry about that. Problems with the okay. internet. Um, so I think when I, I cut off, I was speaking about, uh, you know, one of the academic uh, paradigms for understanding the Gulf is this idea of the, the Rontia state, um, that somewhere like Saudi Arabia is very much dependent upon its, uh, its uh, revenues uh, from the sale of oil, petrodollars, um, uh, and this shapes a lot of the social processes in the country. Uh, I think it's quite interesting, though, to think about what I've just spoken about, uh, these, this kind of international expansion, where we have a diversification um, into financial assets globally, um, but still many of these, as I've, as I've pointed out, are, are very heavily dependent upon the oil industry and oil markets um, uh, globally. So it's, it's, I think, something that upsets a lot of the typical ways we think about um, the frontier state uh, uh, model. So I just want to um, uh, uh, turn briefly now um, to another, I think this is a really important side of understanding uh, the oil price decline and its impact on the, on the Middle East. Um, and that is the question of, of migrant workers in the Gulf, uh, uh, a, a sector of, of the region that often gets missed out, I think, in, in much of the analysis. Uh, because I, I pointed out that poorer citizen populations in the Gulf will certainly be hit. Um, there are poor, poorer citizens in places like Saudi Arabia, um, and these will be the, these these populations will be hit by cuts to social expenditure and the kind of economic contraction. But really, migrant workers are. Uh, 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 essential to foreground here. Non-citizens make up about half of the population in the six Gulf states um, and about two-thirds of the labor force um, throughout the six uh, GCC states. So this is really quite remarkable. There's no other place in the world that has um, such a high proportion of its population made up of, of non-citizens. We're talking in, in some cases uh, the number of people holding citizenship at less than 10% of the resident population um, in the country, in places like Qatar and, and the United Arab uh, Emirates. There are more migrant workers in the Gulf than any other region of the Global South. Um, and because of this, uh, it's very important in terms of uh, remittance flows uh, uh, to the rest of, of, of both the Middle East, as well as South Asian countries, and further afield, the Philippines and, and other places um, in, in Asia. Saudi Arabia alone ranks as the second largest source of remittances in the world. Um, this is after the United States. So it's really quite striking to, to see um, this, this, or to, 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 to put this um, uh, at the center, I think, of our analysis, because what we've, um, what we've seen uh, in, in recent years uh, is, or what we've seen repeatedly in, in the case of the Gulf, is that at moments of crisis, that uh, the, the crisis first hits um, these workers, these migrant workers. Migrant workers are uh, 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 essentially bound to their employer. Uh, there is no uh, route uh, uh, to citizenship um, for any of these uh, workers, no matter how long they spend um, in, in the country, no viable route. Um, they are banned from seeking alternative employment in the country. They are not even allowed to leave the country without permission from their employer. They often have to pay large recruitment fees, um, sometimes as high as £4,000, um, for example, in Qatar, uh, to, to, to secure a job. And once that um, contract, their, their work contract is over, they're forced to leave the country. So the majority of these uh, non-citizen migrants, these, these uh, migrant workers, are employed in the private sector. Um, in sectors such as construction, uh, retail, domestic work, a whole variety of, of private sector uh, work. Um, they're often very poorly paid and subject to um, highly exploitative and, and dangerous um, working conditions. Now, why, why is this so important to place this in the context of um, both the pandemic as well as the, uh, 
the oil price decline. Uh, because it's very clear that migrant workers have borne the brunt of both these uh, elements, of both the pandemic as well as um, the economic downturn um, associated with the oil price drop. Um, there are around 200,000, um, I think, in the la latest figures, um, infections, uh, COVID uh, infections in, in the Gulf. Um, we don't have an accurate data, but it's no doubt that the vast majority of this number um, are around uh, migrant workers. And this is not surprising surprising because most migrant workers are living in crowded labor camps, um, shared dormitories, uh, they're, they're, they're bussed around in, 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 in buses um, holding uh, dozens of people. Uh, and work has continued for migrant workers. For example, in the construction sector, it hasn't stopped um, despite the pandemic. Um, so uh, if we look at uh, Qatar, for example, which is building whole set of infrastructure uh, associated with the with the with the World Cup, uh, it has a very high rate of infection. I think currently uh, Qatar rates as 19th in the world in terms of infections from um, from COVID. Um, and what has the Qatari government done? They've essentially uh, sealed off uh, the areas uh, that house uh, uh, or where migrant workers, particularly construction workers, um, live. Um, They've allowed the virus to essentially run free in those areas and try to create um, a barrier preventing it um, from uh, uh, moving into more affluent um, urban urban areas. So as I said, construction is continuing. Um, they've cut communication networks. Um, workers still, despite being sick, are still forced to go to, to work. No journalists are allowed in. Um, so this this is really, I think, very clear the kind of differential effect of this of, of the pandemic on on migrant workers in, in in places like Qatar. Also, similarly, in the United Arab Emirates, um, uh, there's been a blocking of of um, of kind of voice and video apps um, for uh, for migrant workers uh, um, at this moment. So this is one thing that we're seeing. The other thing that we're seeing is the mass layoff of millions of workers in the Gulf um, uh, uh, at, at this moment. Um, so there's been, um, in, you know, we can talk, for example, in Saudi Arabia, um, there, there's been a, a very uh, significant expulsion of, of migrant workers. Um, there's a, there was an internal UN memo uh, leaked a few weeks ago where uh, they were reporting uh, uh, a plan to deport 200,000 Ethiopian migrants um, from Saudi Arabia. Uh, there has been um, uh, uh, the beginnings of pressure on South Asian states, um, India uh, in particular, other South Asian uh, states that send migrant workers to the Gulf to repatriate um, their workers. Um, and in fact, in Dubai, uh, the, the the, the former de head of the Department of Finance in Dubai uh, recently predicted um, a 10% drop in Dubai's population um, this year, uh, which is a really remarkable figure uh, because of the level of, of workers that were planned to be sent home. Um, so what does this mean uh, and why is this important? Uh, uh, I, and I'll, 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 I'll wrap up here, but I, I want to just make the point that when we think about what's the impact of both the uh, oil price decline as well as the pandemic on somewhere like the Gulf, um, we again need to differentiate and think about uh, uh, how these migration corridors um, end up being transmission um, vectors for uh, the financial crisis um, in, 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 in the Gulf region. Um, when uh, these workers get sent home, uh, there are uh, literally of families um, across South Asia, the Middle East, uh, East Africa and elsewhere who depend upon remittances from the Gulf um, for their day-to-day -day, uh, livelihood. So when workers lose their jobs, they're sent home, uh, we see, a, if you like, a displacement of crisis um, to the countrysides and, and urban areas of these surrounding regions. Um, so I think this is really important that when we think about uh, uh, what does the oil market mean and what does the oil price decline mean? Uh, it's not just a question of, uh, you know, uh, fiscal capacity, uh, cutbacks to social expenditure. It's also about how Gulf states um, uh, utilize this particular uh, reliance on migrant work to kind of push the crisis onto uh, neighboring neighboring uh, uh, countries. So um, uh, there's a lot more that can be said in this in this respect, um, including about the wider Middle East, but um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you.
Thank you so much for the very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I'm going to start with a question uh, from something you mentioned, because I found it to be very fascinating. The whole uh, Saudi Arabia increasing their investment in, 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 in companies and everything, because I was, I was kind of um, interested in knowing what could be like the reason behind these austerity measures in, in Saudi Arabia at the moment. Uh, comparing to, uh, say, a time of crisis in, in Saudi Arabia in 2011, where there was an imminent political danger that maybe like protests will erupt, and the, the country uh, responded by increasing spending. So now you have like a real health crisis, and the response is austerity. Uh, they cut on salaries, they increased the um, um, taxes, and so on. And yet, at the same time, they are also investing abroad. So what could be the reason behind that? Yeah, I think it's it's important to kind of put this in the context of, uh, uh, in the last few years, uh, basically since 2014, 2015, all of the GCC states have uh, put forward what they call vision documents. Um, so these these were economic reform documents, um, Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030, it was called. Uh, and essentially, what these documents uh, attempted to do, they there was a, you know, they were very, uh, they were written uh, very in, in coordination with some uh, you know large consulting firms. Um, uh, but essentially, what these economic strategies attempted to do was to uh, increase and support private sector firms uh, in places like Saudi Arabia, um, to utilize uh, oil revenues as a means uh, of supporting some of the large conglomerates um, in, in, in these states, um, and at the same time uh, increase the proportion of uh, private sector workforces that are made up of citizens, because um, as I said, at the moment, the vast majority of the private sector workforce are uh, non, uh, non citizens or migrant workers. So, um, one of the goals of this was of, of Vision 2030, and they, they put this in various sectors, you know, target numbers for, for what they uh, in, intended to do. But uh, in order to do that, you need to make citizen populations be willing to accept much lower wages um, uh, uh, than they do currently. Um, so this is partly why the austerity, you know, this needs to be seen as part of this longer plan associated with um, Vision uh, 2030. Now, so since uh, this, the, there was kind of a giving and uh, doing and throwing around the, around um, wage cuts, etc., etc., prior to the pandemic, but I think they're utilising this moment of the pandemic as a, as a moment to accelerate some of these changes that have been around much longer. Um, they're not necessarily new things. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, it's also very interesting, like when you mention it, to differentiate between citizen uh, workers and also expats uh, living in uh, GCC countries. So, what do you see, like the future of uh, migrant labor in, in GCC countries with the absence of social safety nets? So, this crisis revealed that the the situation is very fragile for expats in in, in these countries and also for citizens. They are also being hit. Uh, by the implications of the um, of the crisis, so and we see uh, this uh, Saudization or nationalization of jobs in Saudi Arabia and maybe Oman, but I don't think the UAE is following such a policy. But what could be the future of 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 this labor? We're seeing layoffs uh, right now with the implications also in South Asian countries. But do you think that GCC countries will be willing to even consider? Uh, implementing social uh, policies for non-citizens? Uh, I think it's very highly unlikely. Uh, I think there we ha need to, to, to some degree, think about who are these different migrant populations in the Gulf. Um, and there has been an attempt uh, to uh, attract and offer like longer term kind of visa, uh, uh, you know, arrangements for higher end work parts of the workforce, um, wealthier uh, migrant populations. Um, so for example, in the UAE, we can, there are significant, you know, wealth Indian populations in the UAE, um, who uh, there has been an attempt in recent years to try to 
uh, give them some kind of more permanent residency type um, status in the country. But the vast majority of migrant workers um, uh, do not fall into those kinds of categories. Uh, so it's likely, I think, that um, those workers uh, are not going to 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 be faced or, or to, to, to be um, equipped with any kind of social support um, networks. In fact, we can see in this moment exactly the opposite happening. Um, uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the case of Qatar, uh, also in, in the case of Saudi Arabia. Um, this is not new, this kind of policy of, of you know, using uh, migrant labor uh, at moments of crisis to, to, to displace the crisis. In 2010, when there was the, um, the, the downturn, uh, in, particularly in Dubai, uh, and about half of uh, Dubai's construction projects um, were either cancelled or put on hold at that moment, uh, again, there was a massive exodus um, uh, and mass deportations that took place um, in Dubai uh, at that moment. So I think very similarly, um, we're going to see that pattern repeated. Uh, we have a question here from our audience regarding the um, migrant laborers also working in the uh, sector of construction. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if uh, the person really understood what, what you were saying, but they were uh, they are asking if the sector is still functioning, isn't it contradictory that the, the migrant labor uh, laborers are being deported? So, but uh, what? What are the implications of the COVID-19 crisis on the construction uh, sector in GCC, or maybe in Qatar, most probably? Yeah, it, it, it varies across uh, the different Gulf states. No doubt um, there's, there will be a, a downturn in the construction sector. Uh, uh, I mean, I think this is part not just of the oil price decline, but part of the more, more global economic downturn that we're, we're heading into. Um, so I, I think there's little doubt that uh, the construction sector in the Gulf is going to be hard hit. Um, uh, but we see in the case of Qatar, uh, because of the, uh, the World Cup, uh, preparations for the World Cup. Um, we see this kind of continuing construction taking place um, and in other, other states as well. But so, you know, yes, uh, construction is continuing, um, but it's not continuing at the same pace or scale um, that, it, that it was um, uh, in, in, in prior to the prior to the pandemic. Um, also, we should be clear that a lot of the a lot of the firms that are firing and deporting workers, they're not necessary. I mean, construction firms are definitely among them, but there are other um, whole range of other firms, retail firms, um, uh, you know, other kinds of uh, economic activities uh, that that are that are um, closing down and sending sending workers home. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have one last question regarding migrant labors, and then we'll go back to uh, oil prices. Uh, we have a question from Afrah Nasser, and she's asking uh, your your uh, opinion on how do you foresee the future of migration uh, uh, or migrant labors in the Gulf countries in the next ten years uh, in light of the COVID nineteen and also. Uh, the fiscal consolidation policies of uh, GCC countries. I think it's really it's a it's a very I mean that's an excellent question and it's it's a difficult one to to kind of predict with any certainty because of all of the the the, the great uncertainties we have at the moment. Um, uh, I do think though uh, that there is no. Uh, simple policy solution um, uh, that the Gulf states have. Uh, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier these kinds of uh, Gulfization programs, Saudiization and uh, emiratization of, of the workforce. Um, I think it's extremely unlikely um, that those programs will have any kind of long lasting success, um, uh, precisely because these are countries that are built upon um, uh, a cheap disposable migrant workforce. Um, that's not to say there may not be increased, an increased proportion here and there in certain sectors um, of citizen uh, uh, labour in, in parts of the private sector, but I think uh, in the bulk of um, the, the population, it's unlikely that we're going to see a significant change. Now, this is, um, uh, this is I think, uh, uh, I, I, very important, I think, to kind of put up as um, in, in how we approach approach the area, because I mean, as I'm sure many people are aware, the, the kind of widespread abuses that we see against migrant workers, um, they're you know they're not going away. They're, they're receiving a lot of uh, increased attention, I think, at a global level, um, particularly again associated with the World Cup. So I think that's something that we're going to see more more um, attention and, and spotlight upon. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you. Now we have a question from Andy on oil prices. Uh, so he's asking on uh, about uh, when will the or uh, do you think that oil prices will rise or fall from their current position? Uh, that they, uh, maybe let's say in this year. Yeah. Um, again, it's a difficult one to predict. Uh, I think there's little doubt, uh, uh, certainly for the rest of, of 2020, um, that oil prices will will remain low, um, uh, and that's what all the predictions are saying. They, they may they may uh, you know as I said, I think the. Brent is around $34 at the moment. It was around $20 at the end of April. Um, it may, you know, may rise uh, a little bit um, in, in that moment, but uh, over the rest of the year. But I think in general, um, particularly because we are heading into, um, and there's no doubt about this, I think that we're heading into a major economic global downturn. Um, that uh, and in that those kinds of moments, oil prices tend to be, um, I, I think, will, will remain uh, low uh, because of the reduced kind of economic um, activity. But uh, this is, I think, a really looking a little bit further, a few, uh, you know, in advance. I think this is a really important point. Uh, one of the the consequences of this pandemic and the drop in the oil price um, has been a real uh, scaling back of expenditure around uh, exploration and production. Um, it's called ENP, uh, uh, which is the sector of the oil market that looks for new deposits or develops and, and, and um, builds these kinds of um, extraction. Uh, now, there's been a drop. I, I was looking at some figures the other day. It's around uh, about the levels of what it was in the 1970s. Um, a very dramatic drop in, in this uh, expenditure. Uh, and what that means, because oil uh, and energy production takes a lot um, of lead-in time, it's not a simple um, process that could be turned at a dime. It needs, it needs, um, it can't just be switched on and off. Uh, so what this means, and, and a number of, um, uh, uh, you know, some of the bigger financial firms, um, uh, industry uh, an analysts are, are speculating that we might actually see uh, a kind of a, a whipsaw effect where because of this lack of investment in um, currently uh, and probably for the rest of this year uh, that moving to next year and, and, and later we might actually see uh, uh, prices spike again um, uh, so you know that they, they they in in, in the, the previous oil price uh, uh, peak was uh, mid um, 2014 when uh, the oil price hit uh, it was around 140 dollars 114 dollars I think it was a, a barrel in, in about June 2014 so some people are predicting that because of this um, restriction in investment and production and exploration that we might see um, another kind of spike uh, once the market tends to once the demand increases um, again okay but also regarding uh, oil prices now we've seen that there is a great uh, demand shock uh, in the markets and uh, demand is unlikely to go back to its pre COVID 19 levels this year or maybe next year i don't know uh, i'm not sure how many years we can uh, wait until we go back to the pre COVID 19 levels uh, do you <clears> think uh, like opec and opec plus countries uh, can work together to bring the prices to something they can agree on just purely on uh, uh, coordinating supply? Uh, I mean, this is, it goes back to the point that I was making uh, earlier around, you know, the, the supply question of supply earlier this year uh, and this agreement that was, um, see, what happened uh, in the last uh, drop in the price of oil, uh, which was end of, um, Basically, from mid 2014, I mentioned the price hit 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 a peak, uh, and then there was a steady decline um, through 2015 um, and 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 2016. What happened uh, in in early 2016? The price hit around uh, twenty dollars um, a barrel. Um, and what happened at at the end of 2016, December 2016, up until March of this year, there was a coordinated agreement between uh, Saudi Arabia. As at the leading unofficially the head of OPEC, OPEC, and then Russia, 
um, uh, feeding unofficially the non-OPEC oil producing uh, states. So there was an agreement um, called OPEC Plus uh, where these two states agreed to coordinate um, production limitations uh, uh, of oil uh, and they did this in order to try to um, restrict uh, supply and therefore um, keep the price of oil uh, uh, at, at a relatively buoyant level. So that's what collapsed in March 20th. Uh, sorry, in March 2020, um, that, that agreement. Now, why did they do this? Why did from end of 2016 up until March 20, March 2020? Uh, they did this partly, I think, um, for their own interest because they wanted to see oil relatively healthy. But what this had the, the, uh, the other, the unforeseen consequence was to keep afloat um, oil uh, uh, producers in the United States, in the shale and, and fracking uh, industries, uh, uh, which as I said, needed a higher uh, price of oil in order to survive. So they, in a sense, uh, because of this agreement, uh, helped to support competitors in the oil industry. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and, and it was actually, you know, uh, the United States um, became the world's largest producer of oil, at, um, um, uh, and it still is today. It overtook Saudi Arabia as the world's largest producer of oil. Um, so that's why they, that's why Russia, I think, in particular, decided to walk away from that um, agreement in March 2020. Saudi Arabia quickly followed through. Now, what's happened then is that they have come back and, and tried to uh, uh, re-enter some kind of um, uh, agreement on, on supply. I. Personally, I'm skeptical that that will have a long-term or durable effect. I think the fact is that because of the economic collapse that we're in, um, there is inevitably, like in the case of the United States, inevitably a, a drop in the production of oil. So it's kind of like a, a, a reduction in supply related to the kind of economic conditions that we're, we're, we're existing, we're, we're in at, at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we have uh, also a question on the modeling of oil prices. Do you think that uh, the economic modeling and forecasting of uh, crude oil prices takes into consideration the political and social institutional factors, or is it just basically supply and demand? The situation is much more complicated than that. Yes, definitely. I, I mean, I, I fully agree. Um, it's not, uh, you know, uh, I mean, obviously it's important. Supply and demand is very important, um, but there's a whole uh, lot of more complex reasons related to this, including um, the question of, of basically future uh, expectations um, of prices um, and speculation on the price of oil. Also, uh, in relation to storage, um, storage capacities. Uh, uh, so, you know, that, that's, yeah, I, I would uh, wholeheartedly agree. It's not, um, it's not a simple question of, of, of supply and demand in that, in that sense. Speaking of storage, do you think we will see uh, another wave of negative oil prices? Uh, it, again, we need to be, there's different uh, parts of the oil uh, market. I mean, when we saw negative oil prices, it was particularly um, the West Texas Intermediate um, uh, uh, oil, uh, which which was which is U.S. oil. It's landlocked, um, uh, and so that was connected very much to the storage facilities in the United States. Whereas there is um, the uh, other other uh, you know oil producing regions that have access to you know to the sea, and perhaps we saw. Um, producers store oil on tankers um, uh, also at that moment. Uh, so it, the price effect was a little bit different um, for something like Brent, is, you know, the, the kind of international benchmark. Ah, okay. It's unlikely to happen to Brent, uh, I guess. Yes. Uh, uh, going back to the region, um, we have a question asking uh, about your thoughts on the impact of the fall of oil prices on a country like uh, Iraq, for example, and it's difficult uh, situation. Even in your article, you were saying it's very difficult to uh, to to see how they can uh, address their uh, fiscal deficit, uh, to say the least. Yeah, I, I mean that's absolutely true. I think uh, Iraq, uh, you know, other Nigeria is another uh, oil-producing state, which I think is going to, uh, I mean, not not part of the Middle East, but but a state that is an oil producer, oil exporter, that's that um, is going to be hit very differently, I think, than somewhere like the the GCC states. Um, you know, Iraq, for example, uh, I think it's, um, something like ninety percent, 
very, very high proportion of uh, government revenues come from um, oil exports. And when you have such a high dependency on, on exports uh, and in a country where a lot of um, the the population depend upon some kind of public on the on the public sector in some way. Uh, it's it's really uh, you know to see a drop in in the price in in this regard really is is very uh, very significant. Um, now what what might happen um, and you know there was there was a bit of talk about this a couple of weeks ago uh, about Iraq actually offering um, some of its um, uh, infrastructure oil infrastructure up for sale. Um, and, and again, uh, I think at that moment there was a, a discussion about perhaps some Chinese uh, firms entering into into this. Um, so you know we may see similarly in terms of distressed assets uh, that I spoke about in other in the United States. You know perhaps some of these um, other major oil producers in, in the Middle East might also um, we might see kind of a, a, a re reshaping of ownership and and and. Uh, uh, power within within that uh, within the, the oil industry in the region itself. Um, so I think that's that that could be one um, outcome. The other thing that I would say though, um, Iraq is very important in this respect. Is that we need to remember prior to the pandemic that we saw uh, very uh, impressive um, popular mobilizations taking place in the country um, uh, through 2019, um, early 2020. Uh, you know, really. Uh, uh, movements that were, uh, you know, tackling questions of poverty, corruption, nepotism, um, tackling um, both the U.S. presence as, as well as uh, Iran's presence in the country. Um, so, you know, I, I'm I'm not sure. That's a, that's a kind of a political question, I think, to see what's going to happen to those movements as um uh, as, as we move out of the perhaps lockdowns and, and those things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, talking about uh, alternative energy production uh, ways, um, do you think that maybe the world will will go to these alternatives in a post-COVID-19 world, or uh, are we reproducing the same old structures, as you said, like the big oil companies are just going to get bigger and more powerful? So where does that leave us? I think when looking at a question like that, it's really important not to look at, uh, not to try to read automatically uh, into the current situation just because the price of oil has dropped uh, so uh, rapidly and quickly, just because um, all sectors of the oil industry and oil producers are being hit by this fall in the price of oil, not to read into that um, any kind of automatic uh, move towards renewable energy or uh, long-term reduction in, in, in reliance on fossil fuels or uh, you know something that's necessarily uh, pro or positive for 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 the climate um, uh, because for the reasons that I've outlined we could actually see a, a more of a consolidation and restructuring um, within the industry what it comes down to I think is a political question um, there's not an automatic economic uh, outcome so I think it's quite possible that uh, you know if people if, if if you know there is uh, movements to kind of really uh, challenge uh, the position of big oil if there are movements to to force back um, some of these uh, measures that I spoke about in the United States around climate change, around pollution, um, uh, around the protesting of, of um, fossil fuel infrastructures, etc. Uh, if those things uh, are able to gain traction and continue in a post-COVID um, context, then quite we, we may we may see this look back at this moment as being something um, uh, of a positive moment. But um, I think without that kind of political uh, uh, challenge and mobilisation, um, there's certainly no sense. Of no indication that that governments um, are going to take a long-term uh, move in that direction. And that's uh, specific to the United States, or do you see also the same pattern within the EU? I, I think it's. I think also in, in the European Union. Uh, you know, we can see, as I mentioned, uh, banks lobbying to get climate change stress uh, tests. Uh, taken off uh, because of the special situation. Um, you know, uh, we can see uh, you know various ways that uh, uh, oil industries um, are actually you know I, I, yeah I, I don't I don't think um, it may happen differently in Europe, but I, I certainly don't think um, that we should read this as being a, a necessarily pro pro and ecological uh, moment. Mm -hmm. Because like the whole rhetoric I'm hearing 
uh, right now from the commission or, or uh, even here in Germany is like we're going green after COVID-19. But what are the concrete policies? No one knows yet. So we'll have to keep an eye on that, yeah, I guess. Um, now we have another country-specific uh, question regarding the Algerian economy and its dependence on, uh, on oil. So how do you see the, the, the future of uh, the Algerian economy uh, in light also of the protest uh, throughout the last year, continuing online uh, right now, and also this huge dependency on, on, on oil? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 uh, you know, I think the, as I mentioned in the case of Iraq, uh, the 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 protests and mobilizations that were taking place um, right up until the the pandemic hit, um, I think are going to be a big part of that. Um, I haven't followed uh, more recently uh, details of of the Algerian economy itself, but I do think um, uh, you know it's very clear that uh, there's great social um, disparity, uh, socioeconomic disparities in the country um, that those protests really uh, reflected. Um, and I think, you know, of all the countries you see, Lebanon, Iraq, uh, uh, Algeria, where, where you had these moments, these mobilizations prior to the pandemic, I think um, from what I've seen, Alg Algeria is, is the place where there's been a lot of reflection and thinking about what to do, um, uh, how to carry forward movements um, uh, so you know uh, yeah I think I think that's that's really going to be key that this is success or the ability of those movements to continue mm -hmm. okay so I have one last question or maybe we have another question regarding Nigeria and then we'll go back to uh, my last question on the GCC um, so regarding Nigerian economy and the recent IMF involvement as a result mm. of revenues you were also talking about uh, colonial uh, legacies in these countries, mm. them from uh, dealing with the implications of the crisis. Maybe you can elaborate a bit on that. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, it's a very good question. I, I think one of the things we're seeing, um, you know, is a uh, is a uh, places like Nigeria, um, other places that are not necessarily oil exporting countries. Um, partly in response to the pandemic, uh, we are seeing the IMF and the World Bank. Um, and to re-enter these um, these these uh, countries in terms of lending, um, uh, and that these loans are still continuing to be tied to structural adjustment um, measures. So um, I haven't followed the Nigerian case closely, but I know, for example, in the case of Pakistan, uh, not an oil producer, but a, a case of Pakistan where we see um, the, the IMF recently uh, negotiating. I think it was a uh, I forget the figure, but a very large multi-billion-dollar um, loan uh, that basically Basically, uh, recommitted the country to um, to range of structural adjustment measures. So I think that's that's clear that post um, uh, in, in this moment of the pandemic that we're seeing intensification of these uh, international financial institutions. Yeah, of course. So my last question is uh, regarding again GCC countries and uh, the austerity measures they are uh, implementing nowadays and their implications on the conflicts in in in, in the region, like the war in Yemen, Libya, and Syria, and also supporting a dictatorship uh, as brutal as the PC regime in Egypt. Do you think that we can see some change uh, coming from GCC countries spending less on fueling conflicts in the region? Um, I, again, I wouldn't read an automatic just because, you know, perhaps the fiscal pie is smaller than what it was. Um, I wouldn't necessarily Can you hear him or did we lose him? Can you hear me? Ah, now we can hear you. Yes. Uh, sorry. So what I'm saying is I, I don't think we should read, uh, again, this kind of automatic, uh, uh, just because the, the, the oil price is low, uh, read this kind of lessening of the GCC's involvement in these regional conflicts. Um, uh, I actually think uh, that, you know, it's very clear the last decade uh, the GCC has been a main regional protagonist um, uh, in all of the cases that you mentioned and and, and further afield. Um, I don't think that's going to change. Um, it may change form, uh, it, it may be with less uh, money to operate with, um, but I, I do think that uh, uh, the, the there's a lot, uh, the, the GCC um, is really, uh, you know, attempting to 
and has been attempting to to maneuver in the region and, and create its own kind of hegemonic project in the region um, since the Arab uprisings. Um, and I don't think that's going to change. Oh, let's wait. Unfortunately. <laughs> Not the answer I wanted to hear. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Haniya. It was a pleasure okay. to this talk uh, with you and thank you for our audience uh, I think uh, the video will be online in the coming uh, few days and we have uh, Marie I think I should unmute you she wants to make an announcement uh, where are you this one uh, I can see you uh, I don't see very. Ah, okay. I will make the announcement uh, instead of uh, Mary. Uh, and that's um, that. The next event will be on Wednesday at uh, 3 p.m. with Dr. Uh, Kirsten Perry, who will be speaking about COVID-19 and resource exporting economies. So this is basically uh, for everyone uh, in our uh, talk today. Uh, thank you so much again, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you soon in another talk. Uh, yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you.